Adrenaline is released from the adrenals. And, and as you know, there's a parallel signal in the brain. You know, you get adrenaline released from the adrenals if you get in a cold shower or somebody says something triggering or you afraid of heights or something. But the brain has its own kind of adrenaline system, which is this structure in the back of the brain called locus ceruleus. It essentially sprinklers the entire brain with noradrenaline and adrenaline. It's a very interesting system. It is, lacks specificity. It basically wakes up the whole brain. If I were to label the connections of the locus ceruleus, it's basically connected to everything. It just kind of sprinkles a caffeine-like substance on the entire brain, wakes you up. The adrenals in the body wake up the body. So two parallel systems wake us up, a so-called reticular activating system. Reticular activating system. Yeah. Yep. If somebody has a lesion in their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or if you transiently inactivate it with a, t a technology, a non-invasive technology like transcranial magnetic stimulation, they can now just put a magnet on a, outside the skull and quiet that area of the brain transiently. In animals or humans, what you find is that that person or human becomes incredibly accurate at any motor task. Some hits and some misses, like anybody. If I inactivate your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, your accuracy goes through the roof. It's near 100%. But the one thing you can't do is decide whether or not you're shooting an enemy. So you can no longer establish rules. You just become very good at execution of the motor behavior. Similarly, in an animal or person mm -hmm. without a dorsolateral prefrontal well, cortex. You see a trade-off there, right, between, between specificity and, and flexibility. That's right. And so we see this theme over and over again, where as a purely sensory motor response machine, the prefrontal cortex isn't even necessary. In fact, if you get rid of it entirely, people become like machines. If I click over here, somebody has no prefrontal cortex, basically everything becomes a stimulus. A puppy. If I remember correctly, that the mice that were showing tail flicking, which was a prodroma to that exploratory activity, showed a particular form of brain activity that if you replicated with stimulation was more potently reinforcing than sexual stimulation. Right. So here's where the, the surprise came, the, the additional surprise came in. We thought, okay, wow, well, there are animals. These mice will tail flick in, the, in response to a threat, mm -hmm. which is essentially saying, come on, let's go, let's fight whereas other animals would retreat. And that tail flicking um, paralleled with, in the human studies with people being confronted with it. For somebody who's scared of heights to go through a virtual reality scenario of being up on a high beam between buildings might not sound like a big deal to the average video gamer or to you and me, but is an absolutely terrifying experience for those people. But a subset of them will just march out onto that platform or we'll even explore jumping off the platform with the understanding that it's not, that it's virtual and get very scared, but they will do it. Stimulate the brain area that was associated with all of this. It's an area of the midline thalamus. But if we were to stimulate that brain area in mice, we could convert a terrified, non-confrontational mouse into a mouse that was willing to confront its fears in a healthy and adaptive way. It wasn't being foolishly running into the jaws of a predator. It was being very strategic in its confrontation. The interesting thing was if we introduced no fear stimulus, no heights, no predator, no nothing, and we just tickle this brain area. What we found is that animals and humans love that feeling. Adrenaline, epinephrine, is neural energy. It's your ability to get up and go. It's the thing that makes you jittery when you're a little nervous, but it's also what allows you to move forward, to go out for a run, to pursue any goal, cognitive or physical, etc. Epinephrine, which is also adrenaline, those are the same thing, is literally mm -hmm. manufactured from the molecule dopamine. If you look at the biochemical cascade, it is dopamine is converted into adrenaline, which is the basis of all energy, all neural energy. Right, right. And so, right. including thinking. And so if one is not in a place of being able to uh, set their goal on a particular lofty goal, a graduate degree, a book, etc., yet the way one gets to that is by completing things mm. in their immediate environment from start to finish and closing the dopaminergic loop, you literally... Yeah, well, those are at least, those are at least micro-narratives. That's right. Right, so they're not integrated across a long span of time, chain from dopamine, but I didn't get the significance of that fully. So basically what you're saying is that if you implement a micro-routine, even something like washing a cup and putting it back in the shelf, and you know that's a good thing because you have a shelf and there's cups on it, you've already decided that's an appropriate way to live is to have your coffee cups on a shelf. If you go ahead with cleaning out the cup and putting it on the shelf, then you've taken steps towards a, a valuable micro goal. You get a dopamine kick from that, that transforms itself into adrenaline and energizes you. Which then so that's partly the reason that it has an antidepressant effect. That's right. And then you can lean into another behavior. I mean, some of the, the more successful classes of antidepressants, again, not for everybody, are the ones of the dopaminergic uh, adrenalinergic 
uh, variety, right? Things like a right. priorone as opposed to, you know, there's a lot of debate about SSRIs. They tap into a different system.